My name is Marcia Robinson, and we are recording an oral history with Janet E. Hearn as part of the Sweet Mummeries Oral History Project. This project marks the 50th anniversary of the Miami University Middletown, Ohio campus. This interview is taking place on April 21st, 2017 at the Gardner Harvey Library. Ms. Hearn, do I have your consent to proceed with this interview? You do. Thank you. So what's your connection with Miami University? How did you start here? How did I start at Miami University? Yes. I actually came to Miami University in 1983 as a student on the Oxford campus. Um, I, I was uh, kind of a home girl uh, from Marion, Ohio. That's where I grew up. And I ended up choosing Miami uh, because a friend of mine had come here. So I came here and I've never left. So why do you stay? Well, um, I found that Miami was a good size for me, not too big, not too small. I loved the residential feel, and you were able to find a group that you could relate to. I stayed in the dorms for four years, and I really enjoyed that and got involved in some different groups on campus. And um, I met my main mentor, Dr. Um, Dr. Houck, in the physics department. He was the chair at the time. Bill Houck uh, convinced me that I should be a teacher of physics. And so that was my junior year. And uh, I was going to be a microbiology major, but he convinced me that I wanted to teach physics, and he was right. So what brings you to the classroom at Middletown? So uh, I went on for grad school to get my education degree because I got my physics degree. So I went on to get my education degree at Miami as a Master of Arts in Teaching. and. So I had a, an internship or an assistantship with the physics department to teach labs, but they needed an evening instructor at the Middletown campus as well. So I came over and taught night classes as a grad student, and I loved it. Really? Mm -hmm. What was your favorite aspect about our students here? The fact that the classes were smaller. So I came from Oxford with 100 in the physics class or 200 in a chemistry class. I loved that I had 20 to 30 students ranging from the traditional age to an older students and I fell in love so I enjoyed what I enjoyed about teaching physics was taking a topic that most people do not enjoy <laughs> they have a bad feeling about physics bad connotations and having them leave the classroom going I loved physics physics is awesome I had fun um, I now understand more about the world around me and and Every time you get that aha moment is, is what I, what pulled me in. Do you have any stories about helping students um, with those aha moments? Any students stand out in particular without using their names? Oh, there's, there's so, oh, there's so many. Um, there's one particular student that I do, I tell this story frequently. Um, he sat in the back of the room. Um, Every day, no connection. I was trying to figure out how to reach him because he just wasn't connecting with, with physics. And unfortunately, that went on from the whole semester towards the end. Uh, and then I assigned um, Google, had, had started having science fair. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but they started offering video science fairs. So the students would do a project and post it, and, and it was a national thing. So I decided to do that in my classroom. They had to do a, a Google science fair project. And this student had, again, he, doesn't, he didn't speak much. He didn't do great on his activities. He got that project, and he did a Rube Goldberg, if you're familiar with Rube Goldberg, where it's kind of the mousetrap game. He did a three-room Rube Goldberg in his home, worked hours and hours and hours on it, videotaped this whole process that went through three rooms of his home to, to accomplish the task, and he... I'm telling you, that's one of the finest physics projects I've ever seen. And uh, it just woke him up and, and connected us. And that was one of my favorite aha moments of, of my career. Oh, that's wonderful. You're mentioning Google. That's a change in technology. Some of it our is. stories here start with key punch cards and slide rules. Can you talk about the change in technology during your time here? I can. So. When I was in Oxford, we were just being introduced. We could take a class on Fortran programming. That was my only choice, really. So I took that class. We were just starting to um, be able to use word processing during my graduate years, but I did my entire, I typed my thesis, I believe. I typed that. I typed all my papers. 
Uh, we were starting, though, to, to move that direction, and they were still waiting for their cards to come out when I was in Oxford. But when I came over to the regional campuses, we, were, we started to get email, and it was just, I got to see that whole transition. And I, that really uh, got me excited. I wanted to know everything about you know, technology and the new tools that were coming in. And so I've really based my whole career on um, teaching physics, but using these new tools as they've come up. You know, PowerPoint was whoo -hoo, a big deal. <laughs> Right, and in converting our labs from um, where we were using, they, I didn't use slide rules, but that they were slide rules around the room, and there were uh, examples of slide rules. And but I did not teach that technology. Uh, we're getting our the graphing calculators were starting to come into play. So I started, you know, trying to update the labs. We actually had. Uh, a professor in Oxford in physics who had created his own circuit boards to interface with the computers, Apple computers for labs. So the first lab computers we had were the Apple computers. And so um, I, I just wanted to, as much as possible, integrate technology into the classroom where appropriate. My, actually, my master's thesis was integrating technology into the lab setting, the physics lab setting. Was this during the time of Dr. Governanti? It was. I understand he helped us to develop our first local network. Do you remember that, or is that before your time? Um, that probably was during my time, but I wasn't directly involved with the back end of those things. I was involved in how do we use the tools now that they're available. So okay. I did more the front end type of thing. So I don't know what happened in the, on that side of the... Okay. Of the um, do you remember seeing changes in the computer lab? Yeah, so... I'm trying to think back. We, I know we started, Apple was the big computer that we all used, but then things started shifting over to the Windows computers. And I actually remember Dr. Governani, uh, you know, he walked into the lab one day and he always walked around the, at the beginning of the semester and to see how everybody was doing. I always expected a visit from him because he would always stop in. He stopped in and he said, show me the lab, Janet. So we went into the lab and he said, these are Apple computers. This was a little later after I'd been here sometime. I said, that's, you know, we haven't had the money to, to, to switch those over. And he said, I'll find the money, get these out of here. I don't want to see these in here anymore. So he was all, he always had his eye on trying to keep up with the tech times. That's great. Um, can you talk to us about some of your colleagues in the science department? We've heard stories about separating the faculty once the new buildings came online and that there were smaller communities of faculty. Um, some of the names who've come up have been Nancy Tebow and Mickey Sarquis. Are there other people you'd like to add to the story? So yes, I can talk about uh, some of the, the science and tech people around the time that I arrived, which was in 1990. Uh, so Nancy Tebow was head of the Computer Center, um, and Dave Stetzer was an instructor in physics. He was the full-time instructor, so I was brought in to transition as he was approaching retirement. So he and I shared the, the offices for my first couple years. He was, um, uh, he was a great individual who did his own thing. He was a kind of a hippie, 60s kind of guy, uh, long hair, beard, mustache, and he, he walked to the beat of his own drum, but uh, he was great. Um, so he did some pretty wacky things in the day. There are stories about him uh, riding his motorcycle down the hall in Thuskin, yes. <laughs> uh, kind of crazy things like that. He, brought, he would bring his uh, German Shepherd in, real nice old German Shepherd in, and um, walk the halls with his dog. And uh, he did, he had, he got a lot of technology, the first technology in our, our labs. And he, the, the setup he had over for physics over in Thuskin was a great setup. And that's, I think, one reason why when the new science building was built, we stayed over with the math folks um, because there was already a nice two, two classrooms, there was a lab, uh, prep area. So we, we stayed over in, in Thuskin with the math people when that switch happened. So what's in the laboratory? Well, so there's a there, you know computer labs. He's got oscilloscopes and all kinds of electronic equipment. Uh, back in the day, there's equipment in the lab that's older than I am. Um, so he really had a great 
set of, he, he kept his eye on technology, made sure they had the latest, greatest. And then I've kept a lot of it because um, it just kind of brings back memories. And we actually, uh, one of the tech fairs that we did, which I can talk about as well, we did a computer museum and we had the apples and we had all the way up to where we were at that time. And that was fun to see the evolution of the computer and lab equipment. And so I tried to keep on that track and I've brought in the, the newer interactive lab equipment that allows the students to uh, focus more on what the circuits do or what the activity is rather than have to worry about the measurement. The computer takes the data for them and so they worry about properly setting up and doing the lab and then analyzing the data, which is really nice for them. We can focus on the physics. So is there an application of this knowledge for workplace um, opportunities for our students? Absolutely. So one project I always did with them is I had them work as a team and do a lab like they would in if they were given a project at Procter & Gamble, say. So they had to work as a team. They had to do a formal lab write-up. We only did one per semester because those are pretty extensive, but they had to assign jobs to each person, data analyst, uh, someone that was going to set up the lab, someone that was going to research the background of the, the application. And they often grumbled about that. But in the end, I said, you're going to have a lab report that you can be proud of. And then you take that to an interview and say, this is the kind of lab work I did at Miami University. And I said, you're going to have an edge up on most other students that come in there. Have so. you spoken to any of your students since graduation? Uh, well, I, I keep in touch with a few of them. I know one gentleman uh, has gone on, not in physics, I think he was chemistry. But he's, uh, he's, work, he's getting his PhD, and I think he's at his postdoc at this point. Um, and he got all fired up about the lab work, and uh, a lot of them in the end appreciated that, but at, at the beginning they were, they were not happy about that. And, you know, it's hard to get students to work in groups. They're not really trained to do that. So that, I, I said, you're going to do this in your corporate life every day or, or whatever job you have, so we, you need to learn how to, to do that. And so I tried to scaffold it because I really don't think we teach our students necessarily how group dynamics work. So, Okay. Um, there's been another complication in, in group dynamics, and that's that we now communicate virtually. Mm -hmm. I understand that you've been part of that transition from the PC to um, e-learning, and that there's something along the way called Rocket Day and maybe something <laughs> called Cool. <laughs> so let, let's okay. take time and, and see how things evolve. Um, do you want to start with that um, physics fair and who was involved? Okay, so um, as we had this kind of technical evolution here at the regional campuses, uh, Nancy Tebow was the director of, of the IT area here at, the, at Middletown, and she kind of became a mentor to me. Um, so it became possible that I could go for tenure that wasn't the original plan, but then that came up as an opportunity. So she kind of mentored me and, uh, you know, I had to now do some research and, and do some presentations and publications. So she worked with me and, and one of the things that we did together for at uh, the end of the 90s was called the Tech Fair. So this was when a lot of people had not been exposed to different computers and um, different programs and you know even PowerPoint was exciting. I know that's hard for people to believe. I remember. <laughs> but PowerPoint was a new thing and how do we use this to teach and how do we use this to do really interesting things. So she and I put together the tech fair in a committee. It was actually all women but that was by happen happenstance but uh, Dr. Gavarnani supported it and, and put a little funding behind it. So we would go in Johnston Hall, we turned Johnston Hall into kind of a, a, a whole museum area and we put up Displays. We moved, they moved the computers from the computer center. Um, a gentleman named Lee Back was involved, and some of my students, um, Terry Newton. We can't mention students. Well, names. she worked here. Okay, okay, I apologize. Yeah. So employees from the that we'd had as students came over with. Uh, they, they moved all the equipment over, so we moved all the computers in the hallways, and we had themes. One year was a Star Wars theme, and people dressed up as Star Wars characters. And so we set up the computers to show these different new technologies. Students had displays. 
uh, faculty had displays, yeah. and it was it was really excellent. Um, we we invited the provost over. The provost came one year, and the the newspapers came and took pictures. And so we did that for I, I can't recall four four or five years. We had the tech fair, and it was a really cool event. And uh, so then that kind of got people excited about using technology in the classroom. We started having workshops. I was open to doing workshops with faculty about using PowerPoint in the classroom and how could they use that in teaching and, and doing projects with students. Um, yeah. And so that led eventually to um, 2006, uh, we started a venture with some the IT people in Oxford called a COOL, Center of Online Learning. Because I guess I need to back up a little. In 1999, um, Dr. Beth Dietz, uh, realized that there was a problem with her night classes. You know, you taught night classes once a week. So if a student missed one night or even two nights, they pretty much had to drop the class because they were so far behind. And she wanted to find a way that students could, you know, stay in class, not have, you know, your car broke down or a babysitter didn't show up, then that was kind of it for that student. And, and we wanted to find a way to keep them in class. So she taught the first online class, 1999, and then I con converted a physics class in 2000, and we started kind of this grassroots teaching online at the regional campuses, and it was working. Students were able to stay in class. Um, we did some hybrid at that point, and then a hybrid class is where there's some seat time replaced with online activities, but then you still come to class occasionally. So that, that's a hybrid class. I started teaching a hybrid flipped model, a flipped classroom model, where they, I made videos they watched at home of the lectures, and then in class we did the homework. So we did activities and we did the homework, because physics students don't need help listening to me talk about physics. They need help doing the problems later. And what they were doing is sitting at home and working on problems and getting stuck and putting the book away and then the next day we'd spend all our time working on that. So we flipped it, just watch me talk at home and then when you come in we'll all work on our homework together and, and nobody will get stuck. So, so that was a, a, a really cool model. So then in 2006 we kind of tried to formalize it. We saw that there was a lot of different people thinking about this hybrid online thing. Um, Miami University is known for their their quality of their classroom experience and quality teaching. So we thought we should kind of formalize it. There was organizations around the country that were formalizing online learning. And just to be sure that um, everybody understood what was involved, you didn't just take your notes and post them online, that there was a lot more to it than that. So we, that's the first year of the Center of Online Learning. So I did that. Eventually I did part-time, I did that and part-time I did uh, teaching physics. And then now we've evolved to today when we have an entire uh, unit, um, regional e-learning, that I am the senior director of. And we have you know, several hundred classes online uh, each semester. And a, a majority, not a majority, but a good part of our catalog is online. And our students who normally were not able to access us because of work-life balance, because they work shifts, um, because they can't find a babysitter, are able now to access uh, all of our great instructors, including yourself, online, when before they that was not available to them. The original planning committee for the campus was concerned that we provide opportunity for local residents. And in the first decades, many of those people already were um, responsible for families, they were returning veterans, they had already been in the workplace. Um, how does e-learning now reach those populations? So e-learning, they can access their course anytime, day, night. Um, we, want, we want them to interact with their fellow students. So you talked about transitioning discussions online and group work online and we have ways that they can do all of that so they can do their group work still and learn those dynamics and they can have 
uh, discussions, full rich discussions online. And it really helps for those students that were kind of shy in the classroom, that they're now able to speak out a little bit more, which is fun. Uh, video has now made it possible you can post videos to the discussion instead of just typing your thoughts for those people that feel more comfortable doing that. But that's allowed our students that have, you know, they have a life or, they, or they're transitioning to a new job in the workplace to be able to now access us to, to get those skills they need for the modern workplace if they didn't have them before, if their job's been eliminated and they want to continue, if they've been a veteran and they've been uh, serving our country in that aspect and now they've come back and they need to possibly work and go to school or their families need them and go to school. So now they're able to access their course 24 seven and they can do the work when they're able to do that. And that, to, that makes me, I can't tell you how thrilled that makes me to open our doors to more, more people and, and let them have the great Miami experience on their time. Did this contribute to our ability to have more four-year bachelor's degrees? That's a great question. Uh, did, did the e-learning kind of open up our new bachelor's degrees? I, th I think so. I think it's allowed uh, those students, because some of our bachelor's degrees are things that, you know, our business degree, our nursing completion degree for sure, nurses work all crazy hours, so it was very difficult for them to come back and complete their bachelor's degree. Now with that degree online, if they're third shift, second shift, first shift, doesn't matter, they can, they can complete that degree, which is a really great opportunity. We have a lot of alumni nurses who've moved out of the area who want to get that Miami bachelor's. They don't want to get it from their local uh, university. They really want to complete it at Miami so they can continue working at the hospital there and get their job at and, and then complete their Miami degree. And we just love that they're able to do that. And in business, you know, uh, the commerce degree, there's all kinds of people out in the business world or at companies that now are asking them to get you know, further their education and get degrees so they're able to stay with their company and get a, either an associate's degree in business or get that four-year degree and possibly even open their own business, which is a great opportunity. Over the years, there were projects that were created for local industry. And I don't know if you've been involved in continuing that tradition. This is not a question that I thought of before we started our recording. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have an answer, that's okay. Um, but I just wonder if you recall any projects that were can put together to serve local businesses? Well, um, I do, I do. So there was a project with I can't speak on a local project we started with uh, the Miami Valley Career Technical Center, which is a, was the tech, it's not, you know, it's not a business per se, but in the beginnings of the kind of dual enrollment program where high school students could access our courses, um, I was involved in that project. So we had, we worked with the instructors at the Miami Valley Career Technical Center and had trained them to teach our classes at the college level to their students so they were able to get dual credit, uh, which was a great project. So that's not exactly what you were asking about. No, that's good. But, um, and that's now, you know, we have the, our CCP or College Credit Plus students. That's what that program transitioned to at the state of Ohio. And our online opportunities have been kind of nice for those students because those Miami Valley Career Technical Center students were an hour away. And so they had their courses there, but they still felt disconnected from the Miami experience a little bit. But now, you know, high school students can stay at their high school, be on the volleyball team, be on the football team, not miss practice because they're taking some of our online courses. So they're, you know, still getting the Miami uh, level education and starting their college early, but they're still able to experience their high school days, which is important to them and their parents. So that's been cool. Um, we've worked with some local businesses. There was actually a local business, I, I can't remember the name of it, that w worked with us on our technology fairs and actually helped out with those. And recently we've been working with um, Lifespan to deliver our financial literacy modules that they can post on their website so that people can access those anytime, day or night. And we're also gonna use those with our 
students to just help them with their financial literacy goals. And so it's been a kind of a great project for our students as well as for Lifespan and partnering with them. So that's another example we've partnered with the local businesses. As we've talked about this evolution of e-learning, I don't think we're creating a sense of how much the university is now investing. Even in my time here, I've seen your staff grow. Can yes. you talk about the evolution of your center? Sure. So um, it's always a conundrum when you are adding a new aspect to an organization. How do we fund that, right? So that's why it slowly evolved with me doing that part-time and then um, there was a lot of love that was poured in from different departments because they're you know that's a new initiative so eventually we have expanded to add a fee to our online and hybrid courses a credit hour fee that the students pay just a little extra and so that we could expand um, the support for e-learning and and grow additional classes so we have added staff because it takes instructional designers. Uh, we work with the faculty in collaboration to design that experience. The faculty are the subject matter experts that, you know, we don't know all those subjects, but the instructional designers then work with them to create learning objects or to uh, make sure all the videos and, and readings are accessible to our students um, so that screen readers can read them. and. We've added that, so then we've also um, a media specialist, so we can make sure our website is accessible and is um, Miami branded. And so there's a lot of little pieces to the e-learning world that, that I don't think everybody realizes. Uh, when we first started, uh, we all did design. So I did instructional design. Some of the other faculty helped with instructional design, and it was kind of a grassroots thing. But now it's grown, and we want to be able to s support our faculty. We now have an e-fellows group where we have faculty that are doing research in online learning and working with our organization. We have FLCs that, that faculty are joining, faculty learning communities that, um, that we're working with that are doing really interesting projects with e-learning and some research into the best practices of e-learning. And that's been great. So we, all of our efforts and organization go to support f for faculty and students and then the faculty of course are supporting the students so it's all about what what are the students what does the modern student need now in their higher education and we're trying to to roll with that and provide that for them we have an interview recorded of a student who was physically unable to get into buildings needed to use a wheelchair and we needed to make adjustments to our building mm -hmm. um, you mentioned accessibility mm -hmm. I think there's a robot somewhere in <laughs> our there is. buildings. Can you talk about accessibility issues and options and, and the robot? <laughs> okay, so accessibility and the robot. Well, I do, I do appreciate you bringing up the accessibility issue. Um, universal design for learning is this whole principle that we all learn differently. Um, we all are so individualistic on how it's best for us to access information, to be motivated to continue to learn that information, and then the third piece of it is how do we express what we know. We all do that all differently. So we're committed to providing uh, experiences, working with our faculty to as many or everyone, we'd like to think everyone, but as many people as we can. And that includes, if you have a dis disability or a, a challenge, a, you know, an educational challenge of some sort that may be visible or not visible. Uh, so you may be ADD, you may be dyslexic, but you may be you know, bound in a wheelchair, you may be uh, agoraphobic, you may not wanna leave your home. We still wanna provide an opportunity for those students to get an education. So we really work hard to provide that through our hybrid or online offerings because there are students that cannot get to campus. At the same time, we're, we love the campus experience and the students that are able to come and socialize and meet the faculty, but we also have those faculty interactions and um, 
relationship building in the online classes as well. So it's a comprehensive system that we now have at the regionals that I'm, I'm really proud of and I love that I've been able to see that happen. So what's the robot? The robot, I forgot about the robot. So we have a robot that uh, I think you may have seen on some television shows. It was on um, Modern Family once. So it's an iPad that sits on this robot and you can control the robot from another iPad or iPhone. And uh, you can then, it's, you, you put your head, you're, you're in the iPad and you can wander around campus and you could be sitting at home wandering around campus or uh, giving information to students. So we've talked about possibly using it with admission. So students are taking a tour virtually or if they have questions the first few days of class, we could have the robots positioned around class. We haven't tried that yet, but we're thinking about it. Uh, and, and a student that's homebound for a couple of weeks, that's one of our students that come to campus, could participate in the class via the robot. So that has been done at some places. So we're experimenting with it and uh, we like to get it out at events and uh, President Crawford has uh, played with the robot and he is a physicist so he was very excited to see the robot. What is, are there any connections between the regional programs that you work with and Oxford campus? So the Oxford campus has an organization called ELM, uh, eLearning Miami. So um, there, uh, Oxford is a very residential undergraduate program. I was part of it and it's still a, a, a strong program. So um, that, they have not done as much with eLearning at the, at the Oxford campus, but they have done some. They've uh, worked on the top 25 classes where they're, they're popular classes that, that people have had to transfer in for one reason or another. So they're working hard to provide opportunities in the summers and in the winters for their students, as well as a few things during the, the fall and spring semesters. But our students seem to need that excess much more than the Oxford students. So um, it's, it's a lot bigger deal here. We actually have, it's about 50-50 the credit hours that are generated. Uh, in Oxford and in the regional. So you can see that uh, we have quite a bit more here because that's uh, the students that we have need that opportunity to have other ways to access their education. Okay. Now, your career has grown quite a bit over the years, starting off as a part-time instructor in the evenings. Many faculty have talked about the opportunities to grow. Mm -hmm. uh, you've mentioned one mentor. Have there been any other development opportunities that you recall that helped you become the person who you are? That's an interesting question. Development opportunities over the years. I, f I feel like, um, so Nancy Tebow was probably the key mentor that I had. And then she went on actually to Sinclair University and became the dean of their online learning and just retired actually. Um, Dr. Bill Houck in Oxford has was always been supportive of me and encouraging and kind of telling me what direction to go. So, um, but Amy Fisher um, was was actually a big a big mentor to me. So she was our math stat instructor for many years. When I arrived here, she was here. She has retired since then, but she and I did a lot of um, I'd say commiserating instead of collaborating together. Uh, she's very was very supportive of different activities I w I, that I was doing and I could always run down the hall and say look at this cool techie thing I just figured out and she'd be like nice job way to go. She taught one of our she developed one of our first stats class online here. Uh, so she was a, a big mentor and supporter and collaborator with me. Um, so there's just there's always been a little money available to do presentations and to travel to conferences, and I've always taken advantage of that. And I just love to learn, Marcia. And I just love our faculty here. Um, I just love to pick brains, and, and that's one of the best things about my doing instructional design and being in this new position. I, I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. So, uh, so I have... Um, I love to sit down with a faculty member for the first time and say, tell me about this course and what you want to do. I get so excited about putting that course online and just hearing uh, what that course is going to be about and 
I, I swear I could come back and do a nursing degree and a criminal justice degree and uh, you know all kinds of I could probably do one of all of them um, because I just uh, I do get a little bored if I don't change things up and e-learning is definitely not boring definitely. in the in the years I was teaching physics I also this is a little side story about me I was also a volunteer firefighter and paramedic for 14 years so I did that in in the downtime you might say <laughs> So I've been, I, I, I just love to learn and I love to teach. So if I've learned something new and exciting, I want an opportunity to teach it to other people, so. I could talk to you all day, <laughs> but we can't do that. We can't talk all day, right? So um, think about the people who will be watching us five or 10 years from now. Okay. And some of them might want to know at the 50th anniversary, what was it like to be at mom at the, it's, as it reached its first 50 years. Um, what do you hope will continue about the campus climate, campus culture? What do you want to definitely say, this is what makes us mum? So I'm, a, as I'm Miami through and through. Um, I'm getting emotional, Marcia. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Well, um, Miami is, University is a great institution, but the regional campuses are so special in that we're able to be accessible to anybody. You didn't think about college. You maybe messed around in high school, got poor grades. You thought, I don't need college. I'm just, whatever your, maybe you had some unfortunate circumstances happen to you. You can come into our system at any point in your life and say, all right, now I'm ready to go to college. And, and you can come to the regional campuses and have that opportunity. If you're willing to work and, and put it in your time, we're here for you. And you get high class, high quality faculty, and you get to learn just about anything you want and become whatever you want to become, regardless of your past, regardless of your ability to get here, and I think that's extraordinary that we have that opportunity. I walk down our halls and see so many different types of students from every walk of life. And they're all here doing one thing and that's learning and, and improving their future. And they all have their goals and their future. I talked to a gentleman yesterday, um, just said hi to him and he, on an elevator. Um, and he said, he was like, how many weeks do we have left? And we told him and he said, oh, that's great. And we said, how many years do you have left? He goes, I have one more. And he was so excited um, of, of his journey. And just the fact that we've been here for students for 50 years, I think we're going to be here for 50 more years and that we're nimble. So we can offer e-learning. We can get that off and running a lot more quickly than a large institution could. Um, so we've given, now we have access to more people that, that could come in and have their second chance, third chance, whatever it is. And so that's exciting to me that, that we're here and we can do that for people in this community and now beyond this community. And I think we're going to do it for another 50 years and I can't wait to see what's next. This next question um, is going to ask you to time shift. Okay. I want you to think it's 1965. Oh. And there's a group of business people and Armco workers and Armco girls, and they're all sitting around thinking, we need a university. If you were to talk to that group of people from this year to tell them what they created, mm. what would you tell them? Well, first I would thank them and that that they were innovators and thinkers probably beyond what the rest of the community was thinking. Uh, and the way to go, way to persevere, because what you started back in 1965 has not only been uh, a great opportunity for me, but a, an incredible opportunity for the community, the local community, and now your reach is expanding beyond the local community. I don't think they probably saw that coming. Uh, and just what a, what a brilliant idea to have a smaller, more nimble version of Miami University in the community that, again, anyone could access. And uh, they were brilliant. And I just appreciate that. I'm sure that they had a lot of hurdles 
and a lot of uh, probably money to find and, and, and barriers to what their vision was, but they persevered and I hope that we've made them proud uh, 50 years later. And, and I, I can't wait to, like I said, I can't wait to see where we go. Is there anything else you want to add to the re interview? Um, well, I appreciate the opportunity. I'm honored to be able to talk about my career, but more importantly, the Miami Middletown. Uh, it's, it's, um, it will always be near and dear to my heart. Not too many people get to work in one, one place their whole career. Um, some people don't view that as necessarily a great thing because it is great to get other opportunities and to see other places and do other things and and I think that's awesome too. But uh, for me, I've just I'm, I'm blessed to have the opportunity to have my career here, and I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. And uh, so I can't wait to, to that. I just hope that we can we can grow and expand and and really give our opportunity. We're now we're globally affecting. You know, we have our great foreign students, Chinese students, other, other students coming here and able to access Miami University. How cool is that? So I look forward to uh, showing everybody what a diamond we have here at, at Miami Middletown.